In the earlier videos, I've introduced and developed the limit definition of the derivative formally expressed in a notation of functions. So that if f is a function, then the derivative of f of x with respect to x is denoted by f dash x with a dash as a superscript. In this video, I will introduce and apply a very commonly used notation for the derivative called dy dx. It looks like a fraction and is known as the Leibniz notation. I will apply this notation to differentiate the natural logarithm function. I will also use it to differentiate the square root and the cube root functions. I will also apply it to problems involving small changes and investments. Back to the dy dx notation. In fact, dy dx is still formally speaking a limit, but the idea of thinking of the derivative as a fraction and deliberately using notation as a fraction goes back to the pioneering work of Gottfried Leibniz, one of the founders in parallel to Isaac Newton of calculus in the 17th century, and after whom this notation is named. Leibniz notation proved to be helpful in solving certain problems. He considered the derivative to be a fraction involving small increments. His notation was so carefully chosen that it has survived intact for hundreds of years. Let us begin by revisiting a familiar diagram intended to represent a general core, y equals f of x. And we take a point of interest with coordinates x, f of x. Let's also take a tangent line to the curve at that point. And a nearby point with coordinates x plus h and f of x plus h. Let us connect these two points with a secant. The horizontal run is h and the vertical rise is f of x plus h minus f of x. We think of adding h to x as a slight variation or perturbation of input. And we introduce some new, no, new notation and give h the name delta x, delta being the Greek capital letter corresponding to the Latin letter D. And think of delta for difference. So delta x equal to h is the difference in the x coordinate. And we may simply say difference in x or change in x. If there is a small increment in the x coordinate, this induces an increment in the y coordinate and a change in effect in the vertical direction f of x plus h minus f of x can now be renamed 
delta y. And we simply see difference in y or change in y. The slope of the second that we recognized before as f of x plus h minus f of x all over h can now be written using this notation involving delta y and delta x. In other words, we can now write f of x plus h minus f of x over h as delta y over delta x. That is the change in y over the change in x. The slope of the tangent line that we recognized as the limiting slope of the secant can now be expressed using this new notation. And we can now write the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y divided by delta x. So we can rewrite the limit definition of the derivative of y equals f of x as delta x goes to zero of delta y divided by delta x. This has a very beautiful notational abbreviation dy over dx. And of course, this is what we call the Leibniz notation in honor of Godfrey Leibniz. Informally, in the limit, you can think of the Greek delta x turning into the Latin lowercase dx and a Greek delta y turning into the Latin lowercase dy. Leibniz thought of dx and dy as idealized mathematical objects, representing some kind of infinitely small numbers that had their own arithmetic that parallel the arithmetic of the real numbers. In modern terminology, dx and dy are called differentials. They become very useful problem solving devices, both in applications and later in the final module when we manipulate integrals. Let's revisit some earlier examples and use the Leibniz notation to express the derivative. First, we take y equal k, which is a constant. Now that is a horizontal line with slope zero. So we can say now dy dx equal zero. Let's take the line y equal mx plus k. We know that represents a line with gradient m. So we can say that dy dx is equal to m. We said previously that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivative. 
So if we were to use an example, uh, say this quadratic uh, function, y equal ax squared plus bx plus c, let us use the Leibniz notation to express the derivative. That can be written as, as we see here, dy dx equal to d dx of ax squared plus d dx of dx plus d dx of c. And we can now differentiate each term at a time. So we start off with d dx of ax squared. And we should know that that is 2ax next we want the derivative of bx so d dx of bx we should know what that is as well and that will be b And finally, we want the derivative of c. d dx of c is, uh, as, of, uh, as is true of every constant, it's 0. So the derivative of this quadratic function is 2ax plus b. We mentioned in general that the derivative of of x to the n is n x to the n minus y. So we can use the Leibniz notation to write that the way we see here. We also talked about the derivative of e to the x being e to the x written using the Leibniz notation. This is how we write it. Notice that the variable x is the exponent, which is a common error by students to confuse the exponential rule for differentiation with the previous rule and guess that the answer for the derivative of e to the x should be the result of bringing the exponent x down to the front and then creating a new exponent by subtracting one, which is completely wrong and off track. This is a subtle error and the result of confusing the contrasting rules of the variable x used in, used in building power functions where x is a base and exponential functions where x is an exponent. We have sketched a proof that the derivative of sine x is cos x. So written using the Leibniz notation is what we see here. And we mentioned that the derivative of cos x is minus sine x. And again, written using Leibniz notation. Good notation can be very useful, as you shall soon see. Leibniz notation dy dx is truly a miracle of inventiveness. It places emphasis on the roles of the variables x and y, where the differential associated with x appears in the denominator of some kind of fraction and the differential dy in the numerator. These distinctions are invisible or opaque in the function notation f dash x for the derivative.
if one wants to reverse the rules of the variables x and y, it makes perfectly good sense using Leibniz notation to tip dy dx upside down. That is, form dx dy into changing the differentials in the numerator and the denominator. If these were ordinary fractions, the effect would be to form the reciprocal. This equation dx dy equals the reciprocal of dy dx and is a useful deduction from the notation This notation turns out to be a theorem about derivatives of inverse functions. Interchanging the roles of X and Y of input and output has the effect of inverting the original function. So this formula tells us how to differentiate the inverse function it becomes a non-trivial and useful theorem about derivatives. Let's use this idea to find the derivative of the natural logarithm function, knowing that it's the inverse of the natural exponential function. Start off with y equals e to the x, for which we already know the derivative. It's also e to the x. We want information about the inverse function. So let's tip the derivative upside down. Which both reverses the rules of x and y and also reciprocates the derivative dy dx of the original function. This is just one over e to the x, which is one over y. But y is e to the x. So on doing this gives x equals to lin y. So saying that dx dy equals 1 over y is the same as saying d dy of lin y is 1 over y. We now revert back using x as the in, as a symbol for the input we get that the derivative of lin x with respect to x is 1 over x. The formula makes sense visually. Here are the familiar natural logarithm and exponential function on the same diagram. And we get one to the other uh, get from one to the other by reflecting in the line uh, y equals x. Euler's number e was chosen so that the slope of the tangent to the corner y equals e to the x at the y-intercept is 1. So this tangent is parallel to the line y equals x. When you do the reflection, the reflected tangent line now touching the curve y equals lin x at the x intercept retains the same slope. Both of these tangents, tangent lines have slope 1. 
So this, this matches the formula for the derivative of Linux. You can visualize the tangent to the core of an x equals two. And if your diagram is accurate, you will see that it has a slope of half, also matching the formula for the derivative. We can do the same thing for x equals three and get a slope of a torque. And anywhere on the x-axis, you will find the slope of the tangent to the core is the reciprocal of x. In other words, one over x. Let's try this idea to differentiate the square root function. Let's start off with the squaring function, y equals x squared, and focus on x greater than or equal to zero, so that x is just the square root of y. We know the derivative of y with respect to x is just 2x. And this is 2 times the square root of y. We now form dx dy, which is the reciprocal of dy dx, which becomes 1 over 2 times the square root of y. But dx dy is just d dy of the square root of y. So we can express everything in terms of y. We now revert to using the symbol x as a typical input so that d dx of the square root of x is 1 over 2 times the square root of x. Not something we might easily guess. We can relate this to fractional powers and see that it agrees with the power rule that we learned earlier. Let us now try to differentiate a cube root function using this inversion trick. That y equals x cubed. So x becomes the cube root of y. We proved earlier that dy dx is 3x squared which becomes three times the square of y to the one third power, which is three times y to the two thirds power. So flipping the derivative over, we get dx dy is one over three times y to the two thirds which can be written as one third of y to the minus two third. I 
at the same time, dx dy is just d dy of y to the one term. Reverting to x as a typical input, we get d dx of x to the one term is one third of x to the minus two third. Happily, this is consistent with the formula for the derivative of x to the n, where n equals one third. So everything seemed to be working nicely. So far, I have introduced and practiced the Leibniz notation for the derivative called dy dx, which appears as a fraction involving the differentials dx and dy. Even though the derivatives formally defined as a limit of fractions, thinking of it as behaving like, fra like a fraction in its own right turns out to be very useful, especially for application type problems. One such leap is to invert dy dx to get dx dy, which can be used to get information about the derivative of the associated inverse function. We exploited this trick to discover that the derivative of lin x or the natural logarithm function is one over x or the reciprocal function. And we also use it to differentiate the square root and the cube root functions. Now let us discuss some contrasting applications by interpreting differential for small changes in the respective variables. This is closely related to the tangent line approximation of the core near any particular point of interest. In our first example, we take a square and consider the increase in area as we change the width slightly. Here, we've drawn a square of width 100 meters and colored in the area in blue. Let A denote the area of a square of side length x. So A equals x squared. The value of E, when X equals 100, is 10,000. So this square has area 10,000 square meters. How does the area change if we increase the width by, say, uh, 10 meters or 5 meters? or one meter, or let us say even one centimeter. In the first case, we expand the width by 10 meters to become 110 meters. And let us shade in the extra area in pink, which is the area of the larger square minus the area of the original square. 
And you can check that this is exactly 2,100 square meters. In the second case, we expand the width now by only five meters. And now it becomes 105 meters. And we can calculate the extra pink area to be exactly 1,025 square meters. In the third case, we expand the width by just one meter to become 101. And the extra area becomes exactly 201 square meters. In the fourth case, we expand the width by a minuscule one centimeter, that is 0 0.01 meters. And the extra area turns out to be 2.0001 square meters. Though the exact calculations are not difficult in this example, I want to show you how you can exploit Leibniz notation of the derivative to get fast and perhaps surprisingly accurate estimates for these extra areas. We have this function a equals x. The derivative of a with respect to x is just 2x. The trick is to treat the differentials dA and dx like numbers and dA over dx like an ordinary fraction. So multiplying true by dx, we get dA equals 2x dx, which we think of as an equation involving differential. This is an idealized form of an approximation, namely delta A is approximately equal to 2x delta x. This gives us a good approximation formula for the change in area delta A in terms of x and delta x. The change in the width x. This says that a change in the area of a square is approximately two times the width times the change in the width. In our example with the blue square x equals 100 meters in case one, the change in x is 10 meters. So the formula for the change in area gives approximately 2,000 square meters. In case two, the change in x is five meters and the formula gives the, 
the change in area approximately 1,000 square meters. In case three, delta X is one and delta E is approximately 200 meters. In case four, delta X is 0 0.01 and delta A is approximately two square meters. We can compare those estimates with a true increase in area in each of the four cases. One can see that the estimates are quite close to the true increase. And in fact, the quality of the estimates improve as the change in X gets smaller and smaller. The changes in area themselves get smaller, but the proportional error in the estimates get vanishingly small as delta x tends towards the zero. This is related to the underlying idea of tangent lines used to approximate curves, which motivates the definition of the derivative. In this particular example, there is also a clear visual explanation of why the estimate should be so good. Take a general square of side length X and add a small change in X to the width. This forms a slightly larger square of width x plus delta x. Let's color the original square blue and the oblong areas pink. There's a new, much smaller square color beige in the diagram that makes up the corn. The area of the largest uh, squares, x plus delta x all squared, which we can expand on. The part of this expansion to x times delta x is in fact the formula for the estimate of increase that we obtain by considering differentials before, which is the result of com combining the two pink colored areas. The last part of the expansion delta x all squared is the area of the tiny beige square and it's exactly the error in our estimates. As delta x tends towards zero, this beige area vanishes out of sight, becoming insignificant compared to the pink areas. And the quality of the approximation improves towards perfect agreement. The next, the next example is an application of differentials to estimate changes in the volume of a sphere. Suppose you're manufacturing metal bar bearings in the shape of hopefully close to perfect spheres of radius five millimeters. However, your manufacturing process is not perfect. 
and you expect up to about 2% error in the true radius for any particular ball bearing. Our problem is to estimate the percentage error in the volume of metal required to manufacture these ball bearings. Let V be the volume of a sphere of radius R. It's a fact and also follows from methods we learned in the final module on integral calculus that V is four thirds pi R cubed. Let's differentiate the function with respect to R. The four thirds pi is a constant that can come out the front of the derivative of r cubed. Remember, the derivative of x cubed with respect to x is 3x squared. So using r instead of x, the derivative of r cubed with respect to r is 3r squared. Hence, dv dr simplifies quickly to 4 pi r squared dr, which we can interpret as an equation involving differential. Multiplying through by the differential dr gives us dv equals 4 pi r squared which we can interpret as an equation involving differentials. Delta V is approximately four pi R squared delta R, where delta V is the change in V propagated by delta R, a small change in R. In our application, V represents the volume of a ball bearing of radius r equals five millimeters. And we are told to expect up to 2% error in the radius. Here is all the information so far. Delta r may be positive or negative, depending on whether the actual radius is a bit more or a bit less than five millimeters. We can ignore the sign by taking the absolute value. And then the information about the percentage error is really saying that the proportion, the magnitude of delta R divided by R is less than or equal to 0.02. We're working towards estimating the percentage error in the volume. Thus, we want to estimate the fraction, the magnitude of delta V divided by V. Here is a summary of what we now have and what we are looking for. We just have to put the pieces together. The magnitude of delta V over V is approximately this expression. And the numerator can be written, can be rewritten as 4 pi r squared. Outside of the magnitude of delta r because r squared is positive. And then there are some cancellations. And everything simplifies to three times the magnitude of delta r over r, which must be less than or equal to three times 0 0.02, which is 0 0.06. Thus, we have the fraction 
the magnitude of delta v over v is approximately less than or equal to 0 0.06. And we therefore expect up to about 6% variation in the volume of the bar dealings. It's worth noting that the mathematics shows that this estimate is independent of the size of the bar bearings. This method only makes an approximate prediction when translating differentials into actual changes in the variable. Because the percentage error, 2%, was small, we expect the approximation to be quite good. In the next example, we apply differentials to estimate cube roots and also interpret our answers in terms of a tangent line to the cube root core. Let's estimate some cube roots close to the cube root of 64, which is four. Let's take the cube roots of 17, 65 and 63. These numbers are all in the vicinity of 64, whose cube root is exactly 4. So expect to get cube roots in the vicinity of 4. Note that cube roots are fractional powers with exponents one term. So we consider the function y equals f of x equals x to the one term. Then the derivative we saw earlier is one term x to the minus two thirds. Multiplying through by ds, dx, this becomes an equation involving differentials, which may be interpreted as the following approximation involving changes in y and x. Delta y is approximately equal to one third x to the minus two thirds times delta x. In our particular problem, all the values of x are in the vicinity of 64. So in forming this approximation, we take x equal to 64, so that y equals its cube, cube root, which is 4, and the approximation for delta y simplifies in a few steps to delta x divided by 48. Now, 48 is close to 50. So we can approximate delta y even more closely by delta x over 50 if we want to. Of course, delta over 48 is more accurate. But delta x on 50 may produce simpler and more rounded numbers if we are only looking for rough approximations. We have all the information we need to start making approximations.
the cube root of 17, which is y plus the change in y, delta y, will approximately be 4 plus 0 0.12, which is 4.12. The cube root of 17, in fact, has this decimal expansion. So a rough and ready approximation is correct to two decimal places. We estimate the cube root of 65 using the same manipulation. But delta x now becomes 1 and delta y is approximately 1 divided by 50, which is equal to 0 0.02. So the cube root of 65, which is y plus delta y, now becomes 4 plus 0 0.02, which is 4.02. The true value, again, agrees with the approximation to two decimal places. If we use the more accurate estimate for delta, that is delta x over 48, then our approximation for the cube root of 65 becomes more refined, which astonishingly agrees to the true value to almost four decimal places. Finally, estimating the cube root of 63, this time, delta x is negative 1, because the change from 64 to 63, we must take away one unit. And now, delta y is approximately negative 1 over 50, which is negative 0 0.02. So the cube root of 63 is approximately 4 minus 0 0.02, which is 3.98. Again, agreeing to the true value to two decimal places. Using the more accurate approximation with 48 instead of 50 in the denominator, we get a more refined estimate, which again agrees to the true value to four decimal places. To interpret what's happening visually, here is the graph of y equals x to the one term. We are focusing on behavior near x equals 64. Giving this point on the graph with y equals 4. The underlying idea is to take the tangent to the curve at this point, which is a very good approximation to the curve nearby. The value of the derivative of x equals 4 is in fact 1 of the 1 over 48 from our earlier calculations. And it's not hard to find the equation of, of the tangent line, which is y equals x over 48 plus 8 over 3. And we can use this equation to estimate y values on the actual curve. If you plug, if you plug in x equals 65 and x equals 63, the equation of the line produces the same approximations we found earlier, correct to four decimal places, implied by the differential. In fact, using differentials and tangent lines to approximate points on the curve are entire equivalent, are entirely sorry, equivalent processes, just expressed with different notation. In this final example. We will look at a rule of thumb used by bankers and investors to estimate how many years it takes for a sum of money, the principal, to double in value 
when invested with a given compounding annual interest rate. This is called the rule of 70. It estimates the number of years for the principal to double. And it's basically 70 divided by the interest rate. And for some examples, if the interest rate is 1%, well, then it will take 70 years to double the investment. If the interest rate is 2%, well, it will take 35 years to double the principal. And of course, uh, we can calculate for other uh, values of the interest rate. The rule of 70 is only a good estimate for small interest rates. Now, why does it work? Though the rule itself is very simple, the underlying reason why it works is very profound and relies ultimately on a property of Euler's number E. Recall that the importance of E stems from the fact that the slope of the tangent line to the curve y equals e to the x at the y-intercept is 1. So that when we reflect in the line y equals x to form the inverse function, this tangent then becomes a tangent line to the curve y equals ln x. And its x-intercept also has a slope of 1. The equation of this tangent line to the curve of the natural logarithm, you can quickly check is y equal x minus 1. And it's a very good approximation for the curve near x equal 1. Thus, ln x is approximately equal to x minus 1 for x close to 1. Recall also that the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. So when x equals 1, the value of the derivative is exactly 1, the slope of the tangent line. In terms of differentials, if we multiply true by dx, we get d of ln x equal to dx. This becomes an approximation. Delta ln of x is approximately equal to delta x which we expect to be a good estimate when x is close to 1. Making room to continue. Delta ln x, the change of ln x, is ln of 1 plus the change in x take away the log of 1, or the ln of 1, which is just ln of 1 plus delta x, because log of 1 is 0. Combined with the above, this gives ln of 1 plus delta x, which we can approximate to just delta x. As a simple abstract statement, just, this just says that ln of 1 plus delta is approximately equal to delta or any small number delta. If we want to estimate ln of 1 plus delta, when delta is small, we can just replace this expression 
by Delta itself. Now, what does this have to do with the rule of 70? Now, let P denote the initial principle being invested. And I denote the interest rate. Let y equal yx be the value of the investment after x years. So p is the value of the investment when x equals zero. So that y zero equal p. And then the general formula is y equal p bracket one plus i over 100 close bracket to the power x which uses an exponential growth model as the investment uses compound interest we want the number of years x after which the original principle p has doubled to 2p so by the formula for y of x, we get this expression for p. We can divide through by p and then take natural logs of both sides. But remember, taking logs brings the exponent down to the front. So the right hand side becomes x times lin of one plus i divided by a hundred. And then dividing through, x becomes this complicated looking fraction. Now comes the magic. Recall log of one plus delta is approximately equal to delta for small delta. Here, take delta to be i on or i divided by 100, which is a small number. And then we can replace lin of 1 plus 1 over 100 simply by i over 100. Thus, x becomes approximately the simple fraction ln of 2 over i divided by 100, which is 100 ln of 2 divided by i. The result is that to estimate the number of years, we just divide 100 ln of 2 divided by the interest rate. But 100 ln 2 is 69.3 to one decimal place, which is close to 70. So the number of years is approximately 70 divided by the interest rate which explains the rule of 70. Now, lin of 60, lin of, sorry, now 100 lin 2, in fact, runs down to 69. So the number of years is also approximately 69 divided by the interest rate, known as the rule of 69, which is, slightly more accurate than the rule of 70. And 69 is also not too far off from 72, which is a nice number. And we get the so-called rule of 72, which is less accurate, but often used as a rule of thumb if the interest rate is an integer 
that divides 72 exactly. For example, if the interest rate is 6%, then 72 divided by 6 is 12. So we expect about 12 years for the principal to double. It's slightly awkward to divide 6 into 70 or into 69. And in any case, both answers round up to 12. Now that we are introduced to Leibniz notation, we're all set up now to launch into the main techniques and applications of differential calculus. We began discussing slopes of tangent lines to curves, which we saw were described as limits of slopes of secant. The slope of the tangent line is called the derivative. This leads naturally into limit definitions of the derivative and several other natural equivalent formulations, including Leibniz notation, which expresses the derivative in terms of differentials. We discussed a variety of possible behaviors of curves of functions captured succinctly using variations of limit notation, including examples of asymptotic behavior. We also discussed the important notion of continuity. In this video, we exploited the notation of Leibniz for the derivative to see how to translate idealized equations involving differentials into approximations involving small changes in the variables expressed by delta notation. This has some surprising applications such as explaining the rule of 70. Please read the notes. And when you're ready, please attempt the exercises. Thank you very much for watching. And I look forward to seeing you as we begin our study of techniques and applications of differential calculus.